Hey, I'm Devon. Welcome to West B. Our next senior luncheon is Friday, May the 20th at 10.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Guest speakers are Carlos Portilla and Mark Wiles from Youth for Christ. They will share how God is working in their ministry as well as some of the challenges the youth in our area face. You can sign up for the luncheon at the welcome desk in the commons area or call the church office to reserve your spot. Hope to see you there. We will be hosting a soccer camp on Saturday, May the 21st from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. for the neighborhood and community kids. This event is free for kids who have completed BBK through fifth grade. If you would like to help, please stop by the Welcome Center and sign up. We could use your help with registration, handing out snacks and water, and coaching. This is a great way to serve as the kids learn more about soccer and the gospel. All ministry teams will be meeting on Sunday, May the 15th for a time of fun, fellowship, and training beginning at 4.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Right afterwards, our quarterly business meeting or Great Commission meeting, if you know you know, will be held at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. See you then. Are you ready for a road trip this summer? Join us as we travel across the U.S. on the best journey ever. And on this road trip, you can invite all of your friends too. Our epic road trip vacation Bible school is June the 20th through the 24th from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. All completed BPK through fifth grades are welcome. And we need lots of chaperones. So grownups, you are invited to help us with the fun week. Go to fortheneighborhood.com slash kids to register your kids or to register to help. Don't delay. Save your seat for this unforgettable week. Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together. I don't like getting my picture taken. And it seems like every year that my wife drags me out into some field and the whole family walks around together holding hands like that's something normal that we do. And then the photographer takes the picture and then that picture goes on our wall. And every year this happens. And every year I'm grumpy about it. And every year a new picture goes up in our house. And it's a beautiful picture. I love my family. But it's a reminder of just how grumpy I was during that photo session. A picture or an image is a snapshot of a moment. But I get why we take these pictures. I understand why my wife would like a picture every year of her family. I get it. They represent a season of life and you can see the progression of your family each year. Our lives are supposed to reflect the image of God. It's an important concept in the Bible. All people reflect God's image. Sometimes the image that you see on the wall in somebody's house is a proper reflection. Sometimes the image that we share is not, and we don't reflect God in the way that we should. The image of God requires both men and women. God is revealed in womanhood. God is revealed in motherhood. Um, we're having church today. You may be watching this on a Saturday. You may, may be watching it after the fact, but this recording is for a Mother's Day sermon. So it's, it's Mother's Day. And we see God in motherhood. We see God in womanhood. Now, we call God as Father. That's the predominant theme that we see in Scripture, and that's how he asks for us to address him. So it makes sense that we would say that. But for God's image to be reflected best, we need godly women. So we're in a series looking at God's story from beginning to end. And here on this Mother's Day weekend, uh, we're looking at Esther. Uh, Father's Day, we'll be looking at Job. That's about a month away. And both of these days, we're going to be asking the question, how is God's image reflected with men? How is God's image reflected with women? God's kingdom requires both. We need both 
godly men and women in the church, and godly women display the image and character of their creator. Don't miss the richness and deepness of womanhood in the Bible. Women are used to reveal God's character. I mean, I just think about last week when we talked about woman wisdom in Proverbs. You know, what women display God's image in a way that men cannot. The, the church does not exist without godly women. You just can't look at men and understand the church. It requires both. I mean, all the way back in Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, Eve is referenced as the mother of all who live. But this was before she had children in Genesis chapter 4. And what we see there is the connection to Eve with womanhood and how important that is in all of creation. God's plans for the world includes both men and women. And if you look at men only in the Bible, it's a very incomplete picture of Christ and his bride, the church. Theologically, women complete the church. Practically, the church ceases to exist without them. And here on Mother's Day, I, you know, I, I think about my own mom, of course. And I'm, I'm married to a wonderful woman, Erin, who is an incredible mom to, to, to our children. But, I, you know, I think, of, I think of my mom, who taught me so much about life. I mean, just very practical things. She, she obviously was there. She still is there for me in many ways. She taught me how to swim. Um, she used to make me and my brothers tread water for 30 minutes. She would put us in the pool and she would make us tread water just to, just to make sure that we knew how to swim. Uh, she taught me how to read um, and she would require us to read a couple books a week in the summertime. Um, now with music, she tried. She's very, my mom is very musically inclined. Uh, she made me play the trumpet. I think she now realizes how big a mistake that was and I have learned from that mistake. And there are much quieter instruments for your children to learn. Um, although brass instruments, if you play one, great instruments. I was not very good at it though. Um, she took us to art studios and she helped us appreciate art and taught us art. Um, she taught spiritual disciplines to me and my brothers, uh, taught us Bible drills and uh, sports. She, she required us to either play a sport or when we got a little older, either you're gonna play a sport or you're gonna get a job. Um, and then later, it was, you're going to play a sport and you're going to get a job. And she would, you know, she would teach us how to work. I remember as a kid, I got 25 cents for every chore that I did. And by chore, I mean, it was like mow the yard. Um, so she worked us pretty hard. But I'm glad. I'm thankful for my mom and her influence on me. The church, the same way. We, we need women in the church. We need womanhood. We need motherhood in the church. Church history and historical theology have greatly underestimated the presence, purpose, and significance of women in the Bible. So today we're going to look at Esther, but specifically the book of Esther, but specifically we're going to look at the story of Queen Vashti, a hugely underrated character in the Bible. Now understand Queen Vashti has, uh, you know, if you look at historical documents, a little bit of a mixed history, and there's some good there, there's some bad there, but in the story of Esther, she stands out as one of the heroes. And, and just, if we're talking about the book of Esther, on, on the surface of this story, it's a, very, it's a very compelling story, but an easy one to understand. You have a, a Jewish woman who surprisingly becomes the queen of Persia. It's not exactly a rags to riches story, but it is a, definitely has some major plot twists. It's a fun story. Now, as, as some background to the book of Esther, uh, what we're, where we are in terms of, of human civilization. The Persian Empire is, you know, it's, it's uh, at its peak. Um, it was one of the, the greatest empires in all of ancient history. It existed right before the, the Roman Empire. You've got Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. These are the books that occur during this uh, era of the, of the power of the Persian Empire. And it would be the Persians who would rise above the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And the Persians would then conquer conquer all, all of that region. And if you're wondering where this region is, uh, the area is now modern-day Iran. So if you look at a map, that's where we're talking about. Um, and there's two books in the Bible named for women, Ruth and Esther. Ruth uh, is more a picture of the commoner. Um, there was rampant poverty at the time, and Ruth was part of that poverty. So the book of Ruth is kind of this bottom-up perspective. 
But the book of Esther is kind of the opposite. It's a top-down perspective. It's a, um, the, the book of Esther talks about the ruling class and, and, and those who had power. Now, in Esther, there are very clear heroes and very clear villains. And the book identifies the protagonist and the antagonist. And it's a classic story of good versus evil. And the villain in the story, the main villain in the story is Haman. And Haman wants to exterminate the Jewish people from Persia. But why? All right, let's go there. Esther chapter 3. I'm going to read you the first six verses here of really Haman's hatred of the Jewish people. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. All the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by, for so the king had commanded. But Mordecai refused to bow down or show him respect. Then the palace official, then the palace officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why are you disobeying the king's command? They spoke to him day after day, but still he refused to comply with the order. So they spoke to Haman about this to see if he would tolerate Mordecai's conduct, since Mordecai had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the empire of Xerxes. So Mordecai refuses to bow to Haman, uh, Haman being the most powerful noble under the king. And, and the reason that Mordecai refuses to do this is because he is a man of conviction. Haman is a man of conviction as well, but he's convicted of evil. And, and Haman says, okay, well, I, if, if this guy's not going to do this, if he's not going to bow, then I'm just going to kill them all. I'm going to kill all of this people group. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible evil. And you may wonder, okay, this seems to be a pattern in world history. There, there seems to be a lot of hatred for the Jewish people. And that is true. I mean, if you think about Herod in the New Testament, where he desires to kill all the Jewish babies uh, ages two and under uh, because of hearing of the Messiah. You think of Pharaoh in Egypt. It's kind of the same thing, you know, kill the baby, uh, the baby sons of the, the Israelites. And, you know, that hatred carries over today. I mean, we've seen it with things like the Holocaust in, in recent history. So why is this? Have you ever thought about why there seems to be a pattern of hatred against the Jewish people uh, in world history? And, and I think there's a very simple explanation, and it goes back to Genesis chapter 3. If you look at Genesis 3.15, um, we get... Uh, we get this idea that Satan will ultimately be destroyed. But let me read it to you. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So this idea of the crushing of the head of the serpent, the serpent will strike the heel. The serpent will wound this Messiah. So there's this coming Messiah. There's this person who will save. And, and Satan will wound this person but ultimately, Satan's head will be crushed. So Satan knows, from the very beginning here, in Genesis, Satan knows the lineage of the Messiah, but doesn't know which baby or when the child would be born. So there's always this idea of, we'll kill them all. We'll just kill all the Jews, kill all the Jewish males. That, that's, that's part of this as well. Um, and and the per, the, the, what's behind it is Satan. Satan knowing that the Messiah is going to come from this Jewish lineage, and if that's the case, well, if I kill them all, then I, I, can, I can defeat the Messiah even before he's born. Now, what if Haman was successful? Well, I mean, he comes close in this story. And if he's successful, the line of Christ would be cut off. There would be no, no Messiah, no gospel, no church. But that's not what happens because of the promise. The, the heel will be struck, yes. But ultimately, evil will be defeated. The head of the serpent will be defeated. And that's a promise of God, and we can claim that promise. So you see in the Old Testament, there's a battle of good and evil leading up to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, we, we learn of the crushing of the head of the serpent and what that really looks like. Esther is a story of God preserving his people 
to preserve the plan of salvation. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, verse 22, You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for our salvation comes through the Jews. The reference there is to the lineage of Christ and how the Messiah that is now known as Jesus, how that is his lineage. So if you read Esther, great story, wonderful literature. But if you read Esther, you'll notice that the name of God is not mentioned in the book. Well, why is that? Why is God's name not mentioned in the book of Esther? Well, it's because, it's simple explanation, God doesn't want his name to be mentioned. Okay, but why? All right, here's why. God may be silent, but he is never absent. It's one of the great themes of the book of Esther. God's silence doesn't mean he's inactive or uncaring or absent. God is always involved in every area of your life. Luke 2, uh, excuse me, Luke 12, 7 says, and the very hairs on your head are all numbered. God knows every hair on your head, and God is out, always actively counting every hair on your head. This is how involved he is in your life, and this is, this is good news for us because obviously the salvation of Jesus Christ saves through the power of the cross, and, and you know, does God really care about me? Okay, God cares for the world, but does God really care about me? Does he really care about you? Yes, he does. He's, he's actively involved in counting every hair on your head. Of course he wants to save you. Is God really in control, though? Okay, so he has a desire to save, but can God save? Well, yes. We see his sovereignty in the Bible. Uh, God is in control of everything. That's what sovereignty means. But we also see his providence and how, how God cares and loves for the people over whom he is sovereign. So sovereignty, God is in control. Providence, because God is in control, he cares. Esther is this beautifully written story with all of these plot twists, but it ultimately shows the sovereignty of God and the providence of God, that he is in control and that he cares. So back to this villain, Haman. Haman had deceived the king into issuing an edict to destroy the Jewish people. And Mordecai tells his cousin, Esther, who had become queen. We'll get to that here in a second. Um, and we pick up the story here in Esther chapter 4. And here is Mordecai addressing Esther. So Esther 4, let's look at verse 13. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. So Esther becomes queen, a Jewish woman, queen of Persia, and here she knows that she's the one that's going to have to stop all of this, this plot to kill all the Jewish people. And Mordecai reminds her that you're not going to be, you may fall victim to this plot too. And Esther bravely approaches the king and plans a banquet to expose the plot of Haman. And, and Haman here continues planning his wickedness. So we get Haman's plans and Esther's plans Let's pick up in uh, chapter 5, verse 14. So Haman's wife, Zeresh, and all his friends suggested, set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall, and in the morning ask the king to impale Mordecai on it. When this is done, you can go on your merry way to the banquet with the king. This pleased Haman, and he ordered the pole set up. Okay, wow. So pretty graphic plan here, pretty brutal plan. And you may, Haman is clearly not a good guy. Okay, I want Mordecai dead, I and not only want Mordecai dead, I want all the Jewish people dead because he wouldn't bow to me, so I'm going to set up this 
sharpened pole, 75 feet tall, so I can impale this guy. But God's providence intervenes. Esther 6, verse 1. That night the king had trouble sleeping, so he ordered an attendant to bring the book of history of his reign so it could be read to him. Now, there's a certain irony to this. I can't sleep. I need, I need, to, I need to fall asleep, so I'm going to read something. I'm going to read a history book of my own reign. That just, that's kind of funny to me. Um, I'm sure it really wasn't that boring, but the king wanted to fall asleep. He needed somebody to read to him. In those records, he discovered an account of how Mordecai had exposed the plot of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the eunuchs who guarded the door to the king's private quarters. They had plotted to assassinate King Xerxes. What reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this? The king asked. His attendants replied, nothing has been done for him. Okay, we talk about the providence of God. The king can't sleep. And, and of all the things that he reads, it's the part where Mordecai needs to be recognized. Well, Haman doesn't know this. Haman's plotting to kill Mordecai and the Jewish people. So the next morning, the king, this is just incredible story writing. The amazing thing about the Bible is it's true. Next morning, the king asks Haman how to reward a hero. Haman thinks it's him. So Haman offers this lavish public reward. Then what does the king do? He doesn't give it to Haman. He gives it to Mordecai. And in this process, Esther exposes Haman. The king has Haman hanged and then issues a new edict that the Jews may defend themselves in any attacks that may come their way. And all is saved. Mordecai becomes the new prime minister. It's one of these happily ever after stories. But none of this can occur without the often overlooked actions of Queen Vashti at the very beginning of the story. All right, so let's rewind. Let's go from everything pans out exactly the way that it should back to the beginning of the story. So get your Bibles. If you haven't already, open them up. Esther 1. King Xerxes has thrown himself this massive 180-day celebration. And he's doing this just to say, I'm kind of a big deal. I mean, the, the guy is powerful. He's wealthy. Do whatever he wants. So 180 days of celebrating who he is. And Queen Vashti is required to entertain the women. So let's pick up this story in Esther chapter 1, verse 9. At the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. And I love this. It's just, just, you know, just in case you were wondering, Queen Vashti, it's not your palace. It's my palace. It's the king's palace. And he is going to demonstrate how he is God over his kingdom. But Queen Vashti is going to stand up to his bullying. Let's pick up again in verse 11. So the king has asked to bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other, other men to gaze on her beauty for she was a very beautiful woman. But when they convened the king's order to Queen Vashti, she refused to come. This made the king furious, and he burned with anger. So there's, a, there's seven days here where these men have been drinking, um, and v Queen Vashti knows that these men do not have noble intentions with her. Uh, they've been drunk for seven days straight, uh, and she refuses to be objectified before them. And it's, it's a really courageous stand. Again, Vashti's legacy, you know, depending on who you read, is a little bit mixed. But in this case, her refusal is the right thing. And because she refused, there's a chain of events that occurs. The dominoes start to fall against her. So pick up in verse 15 of chapter 1. What must be done to Queen Vashti, the king demanded? What penalty does the law provide for a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders properly sent through his eunuchs? Mimukin answered the king and his nobles, Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also every noble and citizen throughout your empire. Women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands when they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. Before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Media will hear what the queen did and will start treating their husbands in the same way. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. 
So if it pleases the king, may we suggest that you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes, and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. When this decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. Woo! <laughs> this story just got heated. Vashti refused to submit to an inappropriate use of power and was willing, she was willing to give up everything for what she thought was right. And, and it's, a, it's an, a, a courageous stand given the power of Xerxes. Let's read verse 21. The king and his nobles thought this made good sense. So he followed Mamukin's counsel. He sent letters to all parts of the empire, to each providence in its own script and language, proclaiming that every man should be the ruler of his own home and should say whatever he pleases. So clearly this is getting out of hand, and, and we see here um, a high degree of misogyny. And Queen Vashti demonstrates how no man should take the place of God. Now, maybe you're thinking, what does all this have to do with Mother's Day? Usually the guys are on their best behavior on Mother's Day. This is men at their worst. Well. I bring this to light because sometimes on Mother's Day, we, 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 we go too polite. Um, this is an incredible story of a woman who demonstrates a lot of strength and courage. And godly women, and we've got them in our church, let me tell you that. There are women in our church, if this were the same thing, they would not stand for it. Godly women demonstrate integrity and perseverance. But even bigger than, you know, this idea of womanhood is it, lessons for all of us um, and that we can learn through people like Queen Vashti. You should not interpret your success by the immediate impact of your actions or how relevant they are to you personally. Queen's, Queen Vashti's actions hurt her in the short term. They, they were damaging to her in the short term, but they were exactly what was needed for the providence of God to shine in the long term. She did the right thing. It cost her, but then God used her actions to save Israel. Now, I don't know if she felt like a hero at this time. I don't know, I don't know what was in her mind, but we look back like 2,500 years later and that's exactly what we see in her, a courageous stand, a bold stand that saved the nation of Israel. You know Jesus because Queen Vashti took a stand, and Israel persevered because of her integrity. So, you know, we think about ourselves, like, well, what's my impact today? Well, no, that's, that's the wrong question, or what does this mean to me if this happened? No, that's the wrong question. The better perspective is that if you are within the will of God, God will use whatever situation for his glory and in his time. And that's what godly women teach us in the Bible. And I think that's worth celebrating on Mother's Day.